This is a CBC Original Podcast. If you are a true crime detective in your spare time, why not check out some of Audible's top picks, like Mindhunter, Inside the FBI's Elite Serial Crime Unit, or other true crime stories. Audible lets you experience books in a whole new way, where stories are brought to life by powerful performances from renowned actors and narrators. With the free Audible app, you can listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're at home, in the car, or on a jog. The first 30 days of Audible membership are free, including a free book. Go to www.audible.ca slash SKS to learn more. I don't know uh, whether or not the letter was inside the box or because dad opened it. I didn't see any of the packaging of the stuff it came in. All he brought into the office was the flashlight and the letter. Wayne pushed the button for the flashlight and then Justin took it and he tried to push it and picked it up and just couldn't get the flashlight to work and tried it again and it didn't work. So he sat down on the couch and uh, he had bent over and Justin was sitting right beside him when the explosion took place. Something tells me I was blown to the floor here. I don't recall, but I just believe I was flung to the floor because I got up and I started to walk towards them. Then I looked and seen Wayne and uh, I don't want to go anywhere else with that. There's a lot of damage that was done there. And you know, I was looking and I just kept thinking he was alive, you know? It was cold, there was wind coming through the broken window. And it was just so windy and nasty that day and uh, all I could think of him being cold. And it was like, Get him a blanket, get him a blanket. I wanted to cover him up to keep him warm. And uh, I'm sorry. Let's just say it's something that you never forget. You are listening to Someone Knows Something from CBC Original Podcasts. In Season 4, David Ridgen continues the work he started nine years ago on the Wayne Gravette case. This is Episode 1, 9 Here we are. Well, I can safely say that nobody would ever find where Mrs. Gravatt lives. That is for sure. I think this must be the place. Might as well turn the old cell off. Doesn't work anyway. <sighs> what a gorgeous spot. Hello? Diane? Okay, she's here. Hi. Hello. How How are you? Good to see you again. Good to see you too. In 2009, I met with Diane Gravette, a widow in her early 50s, to begin working with her on a documentary about her husband Wayne's unsolved case. I've driven through a quiet area of Ontario popular with city cottagers and country recluses, where birds are more prevalent than people. This is quite the spot. Because you know what, it's, there's only a couple people past me and uh, they're hardly ever up, like they're older. Really, I get the whole back end pretty well much to myself. So. A place where nobody can find her, just the way Diane likes it. Don't mind the mask, because I still got, I've been painting and doing all sorts of stuff in here. Diane's about five foot two and has mid-length blonde hair. There's a refreshing forthrightness about her, coupled with a friendly, emotional way of talking. 
that I think helps her to negotiate the sadness and anger below the surface. In my dock out there, I have she makes some coffee, has her cigarettes on tap, and we head outside again down to a small lake. Diane paddles around on an old surfboard while I sit on a decrepit wooden dock with my feet in the water. The water is actually quite warm. But you can sink in quite a ways. You like being out here, right? Eh? I just love it. I like it because there's no people. People are such pain in the butt sometimes. Yep, I got privacy galore here. Nobody to bother me. I live on my own. Nobody knows where I am. And it's good for my mind. Life and times of the girl way back in the boonies. Let's just say it's a lonely life <laughs> pretty well. I wonder what we would be doing today if Wayne was still alive. I think of that a lot. Actually, what would we be doing right now? Would we still be at the farm? What would we be doing? Would we still be together? <laughs> I think we would, because I think we went through just about everything. <laughs> we had so much over there together as a team. He pissed me off lots, but I still loved him, <laughs> you know? I sold the house, I put up the $50,000 reward, and uh, I moved to, uh, to a little town, and, you know, about 40 minutes, an hour away from there. Didn't know anybody. And Wayne and Diane had been married for 21 years when the package arrived for him in the mail at their family home in Moffat, Ontario, close to Christmas 1996. Good evening. Police near Guelph are investigating a gruesome discovery at this hour. The body of a man was found this afternoon at a home in Pooslinch Township after some sort of an explosion. Inside the package, what appeared to be a gift, a flashlight, and inside the flashlight, a bomb. Wayne Gravette, age 42, was blown up, killed instantly in front of Diane and their son, Justin. Provincial police in the Guelph area are investigating what appears to be a letter bombing, a letter bombing that is also a homicide. And about mid-afternoon, someone placed a frantic 911 Okay, I'll get the cattle. There's a nice picture of Wayne. There and his whole family there. See that? That's Diane has boxes of files, paperwork, and documents that she thinks may hold the key to what happened to Wayne, her husband. Look at this. This is 64-65. Wayne was born in 1954, so he was uh, 10 years old then. Well, he's anyway, just a little guy he was. He was quite the uh, character. Him in school, apparently. Let's see if he's in here. Pretty neat pictures, eh? Wayne Gravette. You know, he might have had his ups and downs, but he was a very smart guy. Here, that's him there. And Wayne Gravette. Never seen, but always heard. 
<laughs> That's what they said. Wayne Gravette, never seen but always heard. <laughs> Diane started dating Wayne when she was very young and was living between parents who had separated. And Wayne took me away from a very bad life. And when I started dating Wayne when I was 15, I was living with my father at that time and like we were transferred back and forth. And when I met Wayne, you know, he took me away from all of that, you know. I live, was staying with my mom for a while and there's this drunk guy, I remember him so clearly and he was like leaning over and putting his hand on my leg and Wayne just, you know, grabbed a hold and shoved him off of me. And so Wayne said, you got to get out of here, you know, like you have to get out of here. And uh, I ended up leaving with him the next day. And that was it. We lived together and uh, moved into a little place up in Lafroy together and we, we were there. So, but not until I was 16. I was like 16 when I left home. So by the time I was 16, then, you know, that was when all that was going on. And, uh, Diane married Wayne when she was just 17, and together they had two children, Justin and Danielle. They moved around Ontario a bit following jobs in the beverage and packaging industry, Malton to Rockwood to Acton, then finally to a new place, a farm near Moffat, Ontario, in June 1996. It was a large property that held out a great promise, a freshwater spring at a time when bottled water was becoming popular. And so, uh, t tell me again how you found the property. Like this. Well, I was going through the paper, the local newspaper that came from Acton, and I was going through the real estate section, and I seen it being advertised that there was a piece of property uh, with a spring water on it. So I told Wayne about it, and I said, look it, there's a piece of property that's got springs on it, and it's got the house. But Wayne didn't show much interest in it. And I said, well, let's just go over and have a look at it. We just walked all the way down, and then we found it right back in the bush, and you can see all the water coming up from the ground and that. And so he got excited now, and it was beautiful. And I forget exactly how much he was asking for both pieces of property, but we lowballed it and uh, we, we got the farm and the uh, springs. Wayne Gravette had spent much of his life working in the beverage and packaging industry, installing, repairing, and selling things like bottling lines, cappers, fillers, palletizers, and conveyor belts. He was mechanically gifted and experienced with exactly the kind of equipment and know-how the family would need to get a spring going. Diane had a logistics and business mind and handled the office as well as some installations. They worked well together and bottled water seemed like a golden business opportunity. So it was right up our alley, we, you know, to have the farm in the springs and what we discussed is uh, that first we would start to bottle the big jugs first and work in this big 5,000 square foot building that was there on the farm. We planned to run a uh, bottling line. But at first we were gonna just stick out one of those things right out the front lawn there that people could just go there and fill up jugs right there. Only a couple people knew that we had the springs and uh, we were all, so excited in the potential with Wayne's smartness and my big mouth, you know, between the two of us. No, seriously, like we were a team, you know, like... Big I dreams, and together as a family, they worked hard to get their plan going. From applying for all the permits they'd need to installing new buildings and equipment, starting at the spring source. And that, that's just... Reader's statements. And, you know, we look through Diane's paperwork from their purchase of the farm and springs. So that's it there. Here's the thing of the property. Yeah, this is the farm lot and this is the spring lot here. And then the spring lot went way back in there. We all worked together to get all the piping up there and so I wondered that way back then whether or not uh, 
I know I really believe that somebody wanted to put a stop to us. Uh, we were in perfect location and we had excellent water. In all honesty, I, like what I feel, I think somebody wanted to put a stop to us on that springs. Could the potential development of the springs into a profit powerhouse for the Gravettes have had something to do with Wayne's murder? Or maybe something indirectly related? It's a theory I'm curious about. Wayne and his family had only just moved into the farmhouse about six months before the package arrived in their mailbox. Or was the family's arrival at the farm in the spring only a coincidence? Anymore, but this is our personal stuff there. In here, I got the reward that I had put up for Wayne for the $50,000. And um, I went and I posted these up everywhere. Like, I put, put them uh, all over all the posts and at Tim Hortons, uh, any place that I could find a poll or some place where there'd be a lot of people. And there was Wayne's bike, his little 883 Harley. And uh, he was so proud of that thing, but the thing had no kilometers on it, but he pulled it right into the basement there. That's where she stayed for the winter. He was so excited to go get Justin his dirt bike. And Justin was into hockey. We had to have the best gear for hockey for him. And there's Danielle. At her graduation, I'm trying Danielle, to... Wayne and Diane's daughter. He was very involved in what the kids and that were doing, and uh, Danielle's piano, and her horseback riding, and she was his everything, you know, his little sweetie, and <sighs> we spent a lot of time together, man. <sighs> Diane tears up and breaks down as she looks through the family papers and photos, pausing for smoke breaks on the deck and then coming back to the boxes, driven to the task. She's been a primal force behind trying to keep Wayne's case alive. She had a simple website built to host information about the case and provide for tip submission. And at one time, she offered $50,000 of her own money to be added to the police reward. There he is. Oh my God, look at this. He's, look how small he was there. Does he ever look like Justin? Yeah, he does, doesn't he, eh? Justin was 21 when the explosion changed his life. He, his mind, he's so traumatized by it all that, do you know that we didn't even talk about it for like years? We didn't, I never brought it up to him. We didn't discuss it because he just went off the end. And then slowly we started to be able to talk about it. And you know, The frantic 911 call Justin and his mother made that day burns a sense of this profoundly disturbing moment into the brain. A warning, what you are about to hear is graphic and upsetting. This 911 call that can never be unheard was made just after 12.45 p.m., December 12th, 1996. I feel sick to my stomach. I mean, we were, we live, we all lived here afterwards for a while. My mom and my sister were quite a bit braver than I was. They stayed longer. But uh, just being back here right now, I feel completely on edge. I feel, I feel sick to my stomach. 
And I feel pissed off now. I meet with Justin and he agrees to return to the farm with me to walk through that day again. It's the first time he's been back here for more than a drive-by in many years. I can't believe how bad they've let this place go. We're on a long gravel driveway between cleared fields that leads to a modern-looking farmhouse with outbuildings in the distance. Beyond that, what appears to be the new owner's junkyard. Cars and trucks and all manner of appliances and equipment piled in rows around the property. In the other direction, down at the main road, an old-style metal mailbox, the kind with a red flag on the side, stands tilted on a wooden post. We make our way toward it. I came down here, I hit the truck on the way to get diesel, and uh, I'd stopped to grab the mail. I hopped out, I came, I grabbed the mail, uh, there was a package in there, it was addressed to my dad. Uh, it was close to Christmas, so I didn't think too much of it. Um, hopped back in the truck, threw everything in the passenger side, all the mail, the box, drove to the corner store, got some diesel, and uh, came back. When I pulled up, I had uh, originally went right inside. I knew my dad was working out in the shop, but I figured if it was a gift from my mom, that I wouldn't go and give it to him. And my mom didn't know what it was. So uh, she had basically sent me out to uh, go get him, let him know there was a gift. So he came in and uh, gave it to him. Justin presents as focused, quick-witted, and wary. He's average height with an athletic build and has short, almost military-cropped light brown hair. A nervous tension belies everything about him, and it's no wonder. He's never spoken publicly about his dad or the case. Moving back toward the house, everything seems overgrown. We pass a stagnant swimming pool filled with dirty water and dead turtles and frogs floating. It's not what this place used to be, but it adds to the bleakness of Justin's memories. So I ran out to get my dad, and uh, we came in. My dad and I sat down in the living room. Uh, he had opened up the, the package. It was, it was like a, a wine box, uh, quite a bit bigger, but uh, was wrapped in white uh, wrapping paper. So my dad opened it up. It was a Duracell flashlight. My dad grabbed the letter and he uh, started taking a look through and giving it a read. As he grabbed the letter, I kind of grabbed the flashlight from him and I tried turning it on a couple times and it wouldn't go. I gave it a little shake, wasn't turning it on. So I tried to open it up. It didn't open. It seemed to be uh, either glued shut. My dad read the letter in the letter it was basically somebody who was looking to do some business with us. During that time, I was still trying to turn the flashlight on, and we actually, at that point, walked into the room, and my dad had uh, explained to my mom what it was in the package, and my dad and I sat down right inside that window right there. He sat down, and I sat down to his right. My dad grabbed the flashlight, and he... He actually set it down first and said uh, maybe it was a solar-powered light. When my dad grabbed the, the flashlight and picked it up again, and he pressed the, the button, it exploded. And um, I remember running out. I remember we all ran out into the kitchen, and uh, once we got out there, it was all smoky and everything, and we didn't... We had no idea what was going on, and we had uh, noticed that my dad was still there on the couch, and when we went back into the room, we had seen what had happened, and the flashlight was, uh, was a bomb. I immediately ran over and grabbed the phone and dialed 911. My mom had taken the phone, and I went and kneeled in front of my dad, and I could I could see his chest moving, and I thought he was still alive, so I was yelling to my mom that he is still alive. And uh, 
my mom was trying to relay that information to 911. My mom had asked me to uh, hop into our truck and go down to the end of the driveway so that when the emergency vehicles did come that they knew where to go to. When I was down there, I, I, it was surreal. Like I didn't even know what was going on anymore. And I felt uh, pain in my arm and I was wearing a work outfit and I kind of undid it and I could tell that I was hurt on my arms. Uh, nothing too serious. It seemed like I was down there forever. The emergency vehicles came and uh, I drove back up here to the house. And uh, as we got back in and the fire crew came in, they just, it seemed like they were just taking their time. And we went to, uh, my mom and I were in the living room and the firefighters came back out and said he was, uh, he was dead. And my fucking world collapsed. This feels absolutely unreal being here. We've moved up close to the house now. Justin is peering through a narrow window into the room where the explosion happened. When the bomb exploded, the windows were the cracked. Everything was, uh, was destroyed in the room. And it was just absolutely filled with smoke. Um, there was debris everywhere, um, all stuck in the walls. And it's just, it was just horrible. We covered up uh, his body, and we, uh, and after that, we didn't. Uh, once the emergency crews got here, we just we didn't even go in there anymore. We left. As we continue to walk the property, Justin looks out over the field toward where the spring would have been, and where that building is. Is uh, we had big stainless steel tanks sitting out there that we would uh, fill up with spring water. We had moved here to work on the spring. We had all the supplies to kind of do what we needed to do, but we didn't have necessarily the, the means to go back there uh, so easy, so we ended up having to carry everything by hand. As, as a family, you kind of, it's that one house that everything was great during. And for that six months of being here, Everything, it just seemed like there was a purpose to everything that we were doing. Everything had a good a feel to it. I mean, we were working hard. We were trying to achieve things. And days we were let down because the spring would have stopped. Or some days we had some good successes. And I think this is where the majority of my family really started to bond. And we were all working really close together. Sure has changed now, though. After everything had happened, our family really pulled together and tried to uh, complete the springs because we never got them completed. And uh, I was just so scared. I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. I didn't want anything to do with any of it anymore. Just wanted to, uh, just wanted to go away. And uh, I was scared. And we had no idea who did this, why it was. We had no idea if it was because my dad had done something wrong or if it was because of business going bad or if it's somebody that was upset because we were going to be selling water. We had no idea. And I was scared shitless. how hard it was for him too. You know, for him, 
in one of his emails to me was that, you know, just him giving it to his dad and, you know, he feels responsible. A lot of emotions came up for him. If he had gone, then dad would have been there to look after us and take care of Danielle and I. He feels a lot of guilt about not have been around and, and been there for us. And I don't have any heart feelings over that at all. The guy went through hell, right? It just did. He was messed up. He was uh, really messed up there. So we had to, uh, you know, I had to let him do his thing and try and get himself on his feet. Our lives are all falling apart, and I work so hard to try and keep it all together. And I'm supposed to be the mom, and I'm supposed to be the one to take care of everything. And I was working so hard to try to, to do that. And I just got deeper in the hole, and we owed everybody. like. Whatever. Diane tried to make a go of the spring water business after Wayne died, but it was incredibly hard. And uh, Danielle and I lived there all by ourselves, and um, we didn't have any life insurance, and we didn't have any nothing. We didn't have no money. And, you know, her and I, we really worked hard to try and keep everything going. I couldn't sell. I couldn't get anybody to buy our water, which we had beautiful, good, clean water. And when they could buy tanker loads at a lot less price than they would get it elsewhere from, they still would buy it from us. And why is that? <laughs> I just thought back then it was because they didn't want to be involved in anything to do with us and anything to do with the springs and whether or not throughout the industry after having what happened to Wayne I'm sure had put a lot of them in a different frame of mind. I think that nobody wanted to talk, nobody wanted to have happened to them what happened to us and everybody thought that we ended up with all kinds of money and a life insurance and all of this stuff and we had Danielle and I went with no hydro and we had no telephone and the only heat that we had sometimes was what came from the fireplace in the pool room and every cent that Danielle and I made went into trying to keep the house and the only support we really had was the police. He didn't just kill Wayne. You know, he took a part out of all of us, a big part out of me and a big part out of Justin. And, and luckily, Danielle wasn't there, but I'll never forget her screams like when they brought her into the police station. and. Trust me, sometimes I wished I had just gone too because to deal with all of that stuff, you know, sometimes it would have been easier just to go because going through all this stuff afterwards, it's not very nice. The Gravettes as a family were torn apart in the wake of Wayne's murder. And over the years, the spring, Wayne's work and relationships in the beverage and packaging industry, and other theories of why this might have happened, have emerged. I want to take a careful look at all of it with them. And Diane, Justin and Danielle have agreed to come together to join the investigation. There's that surface feeling that scars could start healing just by trying, but sifting deeper through Wayne's past is bound to bring unexpected results. The main goal right now is not really about us. I don't care what pain it causes me. If it means it gets us that much closer to the people responsible for that, I would do anything. And I would hear anything and I would look at anything because this person destroyed us. <laughs> destroyed us as a family. Destroyed us as human beings, our own personality and the people we were before that and uh, 
we're very hard and we tell it the way that we feel it and if we want to tell somebody to F off, we're going to tell them, like, you know, just get the fuck out of our faces, like, you know what I mean? And that's what people say that they like about myself anyways, people I know, they like how I just get right to the point. But we all have faith in you and we all believe in Danielle as well. Like I talked with her this morning and she said, Mom, I just want you to know that I'm coming there for one reason and one reason only. And she goes, and that's the case. I'm hoping that it may bring the two of them closer together. They're not real close, those two, and I'm thinking them working together on this, maybe dealing with this could help bring some peace. Hello? Oh, hi, Danielle? Yes. Hi, it's Dave Ridgen calling. How are you doing? I just emailed you not too long ago. Danielle lives a plane ride away, having moved on in her successful career years ago. We spent a lot of time speaking on the phone, and it makes me feel like I know her. She's been talking to Diane about personally taking part in the investigation of Wayne's case. Because she won't do it without me. Right. 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 But anyway, I pretty much, I, I talked with her and she said, you know, if you want to do it, I'll do it with you and we'll do it together. Danielle flies in to get things started. On the day she arrives, Diane, Justin and I drive in a van to the airport. This will be the first time in a while the family has been together. What flight is she? Burley. So if it's supposed to get in at 2.28, that means it's going to be in earlier. Yay! Hey, get her bag there. Oh, Danielle, wait. I am loving it. <laughs> Danielle seems laid back in person in a way I wasn't expecting. Tall and confident seeming with brown hair and eyes. She, like the rest of the family, has developed a mistrust of newcomers to her life. Yeah, I almost got lost, actually. I was uh, coming off the, the airplane, and I was thinking, geez, there's a whole new terminal here and everything. Yeah. I don't... From no. last year? So, how was your... You came down yesterday, did you? Yeah, I got down here probably around 6.30. I stopped in at Ma's. It was her birthday. Yeah? Yeah. She's looking a lot better than she was. Oh, is she? Oh, yeah. A lot better. I think she's breathing a lot better too, actually. She seems Soon good. after her arrival, I sit down with Danielle next to a river in a quiet nearby park to talk about her experience, starting with the day her father was murdered. That day I was driving around with my boyfriend and we were driving around with coffees and we had heard on the radio that there had been an explosion and they listed off the address on the radio and I remember turning around to my boyfriend at the time and saying geez that's strange it's right by my house let's swing by there and see what all the commotion is about and when we got to the edge of our road they wouldn't let us pass you know, in, in retrospect, I should have known that it was my house, but nobody figures that that sort of thing would happen to them. And uh, we went to a local coffee shop that we always hung out with, with our friends. And the girl at the counter said to me that people were looking for me. And um, at the same time, my friend's mother came in and she was crying and she was shaking and freaking out and said that I had to come with her. So I jumped in the vehicle with her and she was shaking. She was shaking so hard and I just kept on thinking to myself that something's wrong and they're not telling me anything. And I still didn't put it together about what we had heard on the radio and what was going on. I mean, who would? So she drove me to the police station and when I walked in, my mom and my brother and my aunts and my uncles were all sitting around a table. 
and my brother walked up to me and he told me that my dad was gone. And uh, didn't really sink in at the time. And my, my mom and my brother were not very, um, they weren't well. I asked them what happened. They said that somebody had sent a bomb to our house. And I don't think that I really thought that somebody deliberately sent a bomb to our house until later on. Did you ever sort of wish that you had been there? I do, actually. I guess, you know, in one way I feel that I was lucky to not be there. But sometimes when you think about it and the turmoil that my brother and my mom have been through, I almost wish that I could understand that aspect of it. And, you know, now all I can do is be strong for them, but I feel like I'm missing something because I wasn't there. And at the same time, sometimes you, you conjure up things in your head of what had happened or what it was like to be there that day that could, could be worse than was actually what actually happened or could be minimal compared to what happened. But you, you play that out in your head and it becomes haunting almost. I relive the way I think it happened all the time. It's very difficult to not know. But I'm sure that if you ask them, it would be a lot different. I'm sure that they're glad that I wasn't there. It's hard to speculate because he was such a normal man and we were such a normal family. We weren't bad people. And when you think about such hatred towards one person and towards his family, it's really hard to see something that he would have done to warrant that. My brother was unable to emotionally be around the farm for obvious reasons. So my mom and I stayed at the farm and we tried to make the spring work because that was my dad's dream. His dream was to make us wealthy through the bottling water industry. And my mom kind of was very focused on that. And she thought that somehow, you know, it's almost like if we couldn't do justice for him because the case was going nowhere, that she could somehow do justice for him by getting that company running and making a name for him. And it was very difficult for two women who knew nothing about bottled water to try and make that work. And uh, we weren't able to. We fought really hard to keep going and it was impossible. We lost, we lost that fight, but we were terrified that maybe there was another in intended target, you know? We, nobody could promise us that my mom wasn't a target or my brother or myself. Nobody could say that, you know? They, they said that they thought the tar that the target was my dad, but when you send a bomb to somebody's house where their family is, you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know who, who's going to be hurt. And it was very hard for us to get out of our head that we weren't in jeopardy and we weren't in danger afterwards. And it made living up at the farm by ourselves very difficult. It was scary a lot of the times. I don't think that I've ever been that scared and probably will never be that scared again in my entire life.
All right, it's time my sister and I get off our asses and stop running from it and try to do something about it ourselves. See? It's not an easy decision because you shut this off in your life to the best of your ability. Every December it sucks, every birthday it, it comes back and... I think Justin and I have come to points in our lives where we don't want to, 10 years from now, think we could have done something more. My dad deserves justice. At the end of the day, he was a person that lived and he lived a good life and he was good to his family and he deserves somebody to speak up for him because he can't do it for himself. But I think that somebody knows something and they can come forward with that little piece of information that would help us go on with our lives and let him rest in peace for once. You know, I want justice for my dad, but I want justice for my mother and I want justice for my, my brother. Danielle and Justin are thoughtful and methodical. Not being present at the explosion may have saved Danielle from some of the after effects of her father's murder, but she and Justin and Diane have all spent the intervening years playing endlessly through the scenarios that may have led to that fateful day. I'm not sure what he's been involved in. I don't know what caused all this. And I know that me and the kids, that we didn't do anything wrong. You know, we were just his family. And not ever once could I say that I ever would ever think he was involved in something that would hurt us as his family. Did he ever tell you that he might have been in trouble or there was anything happening in his life that could have been, that there was any sort of warning signs? Or no, and that's the whole thing that I haven't understood. We started to look at some of what Wayne was doing at that time, like yelling at me for answering the telephone and not want to take any calls. And then, you know, he didn't really want to see anybody, you know? At that time, I just figured it was the pressure of putting on the springs and then trying to deal with the customers that weren't so happy that he wasn't getting the jobs done. And afterwards, the, when I went through it all with the police, they were putting two and two together and saying that they believed that we knew something was wrong. And what I didn't understand is, well, if he knew something was wrong, why would he tell me? Before I can start looking into the theories, who or why or was there something Wayne wasn't telling his family, I want to talk to police and follow the trail of the package. Photos from the crime scene show a gray metal mailbox decorated with a red ribbon for the holidays at the end of the farmhouse laneway. There was barely any snow on the ground that mid-December of 1996, and the family hadn't been there long. But someone knew their address. Someone's hands typed the letter. Someone's fingers wrapped that package. Someone's arms lifted it to be delivered to Wayne Gravette. You have been listening to episode one, nine one one. Visit cbc.ca slash SKS to see photos of the Gravette family. Someone Knows Something is a proud part of CBC Original Podcasts. If you're hungry for another series, check out The Fridge Light. The reaction we got was phenomenal. Yeah, everybody wanted to try it. It was self-explanatory. You go into a store and you saw, you know, that packaging, the gelatin balls. It sold itself. At its launch, I'm thinking, we've got a billion-dollar baby here. Subscribe in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to SKS. Someone Knows Something is hosted, written, and produced by David Ridgen. The series is mixed by Cecil Fernandez and produced by Chris Oak, Steph Kampf. Amal Delich, Eunice Kim, an executive producer, 
Arif Nurani. Our theme song is Higher by Olenka Krakis. Baby, oh baby, where have you gone? I've been lonely and tired and angry too long. I've been passing my time with my memories of you. Keeps fading Whatever of you 